Welcome to African Roots, brought to you by DW. In this podcast series, we discover how individuals from across Africa shaped the continent. I'm Kai Nebe. And I'm Leila Johnson Salami. Leila, it's good to see you again. Hey, Kai. <laughs> What's up? Leila, I've got a giant lined up for this episode of African Roots. Do you want to guess who it is? Mm, I mean, I can try, but you know, we have several African giants. Um, I am going to need a hint. <laughs> Fine. If I told you that he's been called Africa's Che Guevara. Thomas Sankara from Burkina Faso. I'm correct, good. right? Good, good. Well done, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, why has he been called Africa's Che Guevara? Well, Leila, to the people of Burkina Faso, he's even more than that. But the comparison between, you know, a Cuban revolutionary and Thomas Sankara makes sense in some ways. Both were revolutionaries with socialist leanings. Both men were young, extremely charismatic. And their downfalls in pursuit of something better for their respective countries have galvanized millions of young people. Oh, and both of them had a thing for motorcycles. Uh, yeah, you know, motorcycles are literally like my biggest phobia. <laughs> <laughs> well, not for Thomas Sankara and definitely not for Che Guevara. But let's stick with Thomas Sankara for now. And let's start from the beginning. Um, Thomas Sankara was an army officer in what was then known as the Upper Volta in West Africa. When he took power of the country in a military coup in 1983, many African countries were experiencing coups at this time. Often they were peaceful. So it was sort of the norm in a way. Mm. Now Sankara took over a country heavily reliant on the colonial power France and it was incompetently run, it was desperately poor and and even 20 years after independence, Sankara still wanted this revolution to free uh, his country of the dependence on France and really just to take pride in itself. The slave who deludes himself that his suspiciously condescending master will set him free is responsible for his misfortune. Only the struggle liberates. So I guess one of the first things he did was to rename the Upper Volta to Burkina Faso. And Burkina Faso um, means land of the upright people. Which is a powerful name indeed, I must say. Yeah, right. I mean, but that that's not where it stopped. I mean, Sankara wasn't someone for half measures. He took on corruption. He famously made all the ministers uh, ditch their luxury Mercedes Benzes for small, cheap Renault 5s, something that applied to him as well. His next changes were sweeping healthcare, education and agriculture reforms. Women could now go to school even when pregnant. Um, farming received unprecedented investment within the country. Uh, Sankara rejected this paternalistic aid on principle uh, from the West. And he promoted sort of a pride in the Burkina Bay people, especially those in far-flung rural areas where the majority of Burkina Bears lived. And another key thing was literacy programs were introduced basically to try and get the, 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 the rural communities up to speed. And uh, clinics and hospitals were also opened. And I guess like also a big thing, Leila, and I guess you'll also like this, is that this, this, this change he made regarding lifting the rights of women, that was a huge step for this country. Yeah, no, I mean, it absolutely was. And Honestly, I, I must say, this is why um, Thomas Sankara is one of my favorite people in African history. But I have always wondered, like, how he was able to do this, like getting people in government to ditch their Benzes for uh, cheaper Renaults. I mean, in today's Nigeria, I don't want to speak for the rest of Africa, but I can't imagine a situation where whoever's in power um, can get our people in government to ditch their fancy cars, you know, for cheaper cars. So I've always wondered, um, how was he able to do this? I mean, it's hard to say, but the thing with Sankara was that that was really part of of his persona. He was very charismatic and he was very humble. He was very much the exact opposite of the stereotypical political elite and a lot of people loved him for, for that and they really respected him for it. So I'll let Muspila Sankara, who was Burkina Faso's ambassador to Libya at the time, explain just what the Sankara effect was like. Thomas was understood by the poor, 
by those who were looking for justice and recognition, by those who, despite their poverty, had an identity and were proud of belonging to their community and to their nation. His main characteristic was that he used his integrity both to serve his country and his people. But all of this, um, this charisma and uh, the this this shift of focus was good for many people, at least from a spiritual and also kind of a pride point of view. But it 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 also really irked the the classes that had benefited a lot from the previous system. There were very many uh, Burkina Bay businessmen who didn't like Sankara. There were middle class people who had earned money in the previous regime who then suddenly felt that they were being undermined. And also traditional authorities that had basically been stripped of their privileges either from the colonial regime or also in the post-colonial era. And Sankara really upset many of these norms. I mean, he made the right moves, but typical, right? I mean, I'm not surprised that many of them um, couldn't stand his choices. And uh, the other issue for Sankara was that it wasn't just inside the country that he made enemies, also outside, and especially with France, the former colonial power. Um, and, you know, over the course of his rule, Sankara became more and more isolated, especially after four years in power. Unfortunately, despite his reforms, poverty remained extreme. Um, the committees that Sankara had set up to sort of govern rural areas uh, started to attack them and acted more like militias than actually government tribunals he set up convicted hundreds of people sometimes with no evidence and just four years after he took power Sankara was assassinated in a plot masterminded by his successor Blaise Compaore with the tacit approval from France. And what was Campore's relationship to Sankara? Well, it was complicated. When Sankara took power in the military coup earlier that decade, Campore was his right-hand man. They were best friends, um, allegedly. The thing is that Campore turned on Sankara and in many quarters was then held as, uh, um, responsible for his death. And Kompoore then took over um, Burkina Faso and it became a, a dictatorship. He was the exact opposite of Sankara. His allies looted the state funds dry. And it was only in 2014, almost 30 years after taking power, when huge protest action in Burkina Faso forced him to really give up power. And he fled into exile in the Ivory Coast. What, for his bad leadership? Well, no, not actually. It was more to do with the allegations that he was one of the main people who had plotted Sankara's death. You know, Kai, life is so deep. I mean, let's just backtrack for a second. We are talking about his supposed best friend. You know, when they say trust no one, right? <laughs> well, definitely. And it was something, I guess, that when Sankara obviously did not see coming. He expected the he expected forces from outside of the country to attack him, but I don't think he expected his best friend to be doing that. Bruno Jaffrey, the leading scholar on Sankara, explains why many people hold Compaore responsible, ultimately. Donc, euh, simplement, il est inculpé dans cet assassinat. Il est sous le coup d'une menace, euh, d'une demande d'extradition. His involvement is obvious. The man who killed Sankara answered to the chief of security, Gilbert Diendère, and he was Blaise Compaore's right-hand man during his whole presidency. De Blaise Compaore pendant tout le régime. Donc, voilà un peu les ramifications. Que les noms des membres du commando sont connus. So... Compaore has always denied these allegations that he was really behind them. I mean, even though he took power straight after uh, Sankara, uh, Sankara's death. And the thing is, earlier in Compaore's reign, um, Sankara was just, you know, another military figure. But his image has grown in recent years. And um, at a recent trial, Burkina Faso sentenced uh, Blaise Compaore to life imprisonment in, its, in, in absentia. And um, for supporters like Pia Oadrogo, president of the Thomas Sankara International Memorial Committee, the trial, I guess, was more symbolic than people knowing someone would be punished for it. We cannot resurrect Thomas Sankara, but we want that in the future it should be part of Burkina's values that the people's weapons entrusted to the army should not be used to kill the people's leaders. 
And and Leila, I have to stress again. I mean, Blaise Compaore uh, ruled Burkina Faso for 27 years, and Sankara ruled for just four years. But Sankara's name carries so much weight across Africa that he's almost like the thing that people most, um, you know, associate with Burkina Faso. And it really was that he gave the country a new identity. And it's almost that he became more famous in the afterlife than while he was a leader. When we come back, we'll meet another iconic leader uh, who led his country to independence, but not for long. DW African Roots. Find new African Roots episodes on dw.com slash African Roots, Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. Kai, let's roll back the clock just a bit, about 20 years before Sankara. And, you know, you made me guess, so I'm going to make you guess. <laughs> Who am I talking about here? Uh, 20 years before Sankara. Okay, that's that's around the time of many African countries becoming independent. But come, come give me some geographical context. Uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me be a bit more fair. We're, we're talking about someone who was in the Belgian Congo at the time. Okay, so okay, that narrows it down quite a lot. But I think I'm going to go with Patrice Lumumba. And is is that spot on. Am I right? <laughs> you are spot on. <laughs> and, you know, like Sankara, um, Patrice Lumumba was hungry for independence from the West. And he was really vocal about it. Um, maybe a bit too vocal for some. Ooh, okay. So is that sounding bad? Or what? Uh, yeah, I mean, his contempt for colonial masters, um, Belgium, was palpable. Compelling the white man to respect, announcing in a clear loud tones from this time on, this country no longer belongs to him. You made the brothers of your race lift up their heads to see clear, straight ahead, the happy future promised by deliverance. So, I think I remember that. Is that is that a is that a poem by Lumumba? Now that's a poem by Lumumba that came after Belgian colonial authorities had violently suppressed pro-independence protests in the capital um, Leopoldville, which is today's Kinshasa. Um, Lumumba was incensed and rallied against Belgium's colonial administration. And here we're back in January 1959. Um, the fight for independence had started and Patrice Lumumba had emerged as a leader of the anti-colonialist movement. Um, he really did condemn the colonialists. Well, let me give some more context to this. Um, here's Kambayi Boachia, a history professor and an authority on Lumumba's life. So move more. Are you a mentor? This movement had a mentor, a man with a fiery temperament, open to the world, Lumumba, a dazzling man. A man who did not like injustice, a man who knew what alienation was, who had followed the development in Guinea, how the Guineans said no to the politics of the French community. And Lumumba took this path, and he went against Belgian colonial politics. Okay, Leila, so he was against colonialism, but that's like, there was a lot of people that were against colonialism at that time. So what was Lumumba's background and, and why was he so anti-Belgium? Okay, so let's start with the first question. Um, Lumumba was a relatively well-educated man, right? And he had worked various jobs. Most Congolese were purposefully held back for, um, by the colonial administration he was a postal worker, a sales director for a brewery, and also a press correspondent. Wow, that's that's quite a crazy CV to have. I mean, he was pretty much a, a jack of all trades, would you say? <laughs> yeah, he was essentially a jack of all trades. Um, but by the age of 30, Lumumba had also become a leading pro-independence voice. He read extensively, Kai, of anti-colonial struggles across the African continent, and he became convinced that it was time to call for independence and a united Congo. Also, the Belgian colonial administration was considered notoriously brutal, so even among other colonial powers, um, with officers and colonists acting with impunity and 
thousands of Congolese effectively forced into slave ma- um, into slave labor. Um, so it was extremely cruel. Right. So, but so so Lumumba then was quite widely supported then with his calls for independence and also you know just get the Belgians out of here. I mean, it's tricky. He he definitely was in some quarters. Um, remember, the Congo is a huge country, much bigger than all of Western Europe combined. And in the run up to independence, the fledging political class were deeply divided along ethnic lines. Um, many of them had developed cozy relationships with Belgian interests. And they kind of felt threatened by Lumumba's anti-tribalist vision for for a united Congo. Um, They were quite against this. Um, And I must say, um, whose identity was predicated on its overthrow of colonialism? Right. So I guess this must have definitely been a problem for the, the fight for independence as such. There was no like... Was there like a unified front or what really? I mean, it it certainly was a problem, I must say. Um, Colonial authorities who, until recently, by the way, um, hadn't planned for an independent Congolese state, didn't they really didn't want to see a strong united Congo and they were quick to take advantage of these conflicts you know these ethnic conflicts that were going on let's not forget Kai that we are also talking about pretty much the most resource rich region on the African continent well and like the second biggest country in Africa it's it's huge like you said yeah well yeah exactly you know with a lot of forces pulling in all directions but you know still the but he did remain quite idealistic. Um, he was a very charismatic guy, and his Congolese national movement widely won the nation's first general elections, and that was in May 1960. Now, as Prime Minister, Patrice Lumumba had little time for appeasing the former colonizers. At an independent ceremony, Belgian King Baudouin um, referred to his grandfather, King Leopold, who oversaw the worst of Belgium's um, colonial cruelty, as a genius, um, Lumumba, of course, did not think so. Homage aux combattants de la liberté nationale. Tribute to the fighters for national freedom. We have known disgrace, insults and blows that we had to endure morning, noon and evening because we were Negros. Who will forget the shootings from which so many of our brothers perished? the cells into which those who refused to submit to a regime of injustice, oppression and exploitation were brutally thrown. So at this point, the Congolese who were present in the room applauded wildly, right? But for Baudouin and other Western dignitaries that were present, um, Lumumba's speech was an insult to them and an insult that he would be punished for. Um, let's listen in to Professor Kambayi Bwachia again, who we heard from earlier. He offended the king. He offended Belgium. After the speech, he went into turmoil. The force publique, responsible for public order, became dysfunctional. There were no experienced high-ranking Congolese officials anywhere. Public service deteriorated. Security deteriorated. Lumumba did not have the legitimate tools to govern. He was alone. The Belgians and the imperialists completely disoriented the country. There was a terrible chaos. It really sounds like, Leila, that that he was up against sort of a lot of external forces and that, you know, everything that suddenly could go wrong did go wrong. Yeah, that's essentially it. You know, there was indeed a lot of chaos and quickly is a key word. Um, Everything that could go wrong went wrong so quickly. And, you know, the fledging Congo fell apart also because Prime Minister Lumumba and his president, um, Joseph Kazavubu, they couldn't work together. Then the resource-rich provinces of South Kasai and also of um, Katanga seceded with Belgian support. And Lumumba also had quite an authoritarian streak to him. And he kind of dismissed those that didn't really agree with him. So his attempts to like play on the Cold War rivalries when he sought, you know, both Soviet and Western assistance, for example, to help his wilting states kind of also placed him in a precarious position. Wait, so... The West was also kind of accusing him of collaborating with the communists or what? 
Well, Western powers and secret services definitely used anti-communist sentiments to justify their actions in the Congo, um, which of course only led to more chaos, Kai. I mean, war broke out, the army mutinied. Um, It was a disaster. And behind the scenes, former colonial powers sought to look after their interests, obviously without any concern for bringing peace to the Congo region. I mean, this, Lelo, you're painting kind of a very chaotic picture of Congolese independence. I mean, how did it end? Yeah, chaos is another key word. I mean, well, when Joseph Desiree Mobutu, um, who was then the chief of staff, seized power, um, he later arrested Lumumba and Lumumba was assassinated with the support of Belgium and even the United States. That was in January 1961. So you know at the beginning, Kai, when I said um, this didn't really last for long for Lumumba, that's what I'm talking about. The speech he made was in 1960 and he was assassinated the following year. Wow. It's, yeah, it's just incredible to see, you know, as you were describing this very fast way and this euphoria of independence suddenly disintegrating in chaos and, and, but 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 then what what happened afterwards like where do you where, where does a fledgling country go then after that Lumumba's death did cause outrage um and the manner in which the Congolese state was allowed to collapse did shock the world it seemed though that Lumumba kind of knew his fate before um in one of his last letters he wrote that the nation will know that I offered myself as a hostage for its freedom. And that's quite profound. Well, it, it is. In, it is indeed. It sounds also, it also sounds like a man who really did have an idealistic vision um, that of, of a united country, but somehow was either never allowed to materialize or just could never materialize. Yeah, you know, and that's kind of like... Um, you know, where it's a bit of a shame. Um, After Lumumba was killed, Mobutu became pretty much, you know, the kind of stereotypical, repressive and corrupt dictator. Um, And that was before he was overthrown in 1997. And since then, as most people know, you know, the modern Democratic Republic of Congo has never been a fully secure nation. It's never really fully recovered from this. You know, it's it's fascinating kind of the parallels between who we were speaking about, Thomas Sankara and now Patrice Lumumba, both of them in power for such a short time and then being succeeded by dictators for, you know, almost three decades. Um, their dreams or like their hopes for their countries and the way that they were both assassinated. Leila, do you think we could really call Sankara and Lumumba martyrs here? Or what do you think? I mean, that's one side of it. You know how, like I said, you know, with Lumumba saying that the nation will know that I offered myself as a hostage for its freedom. We also know that Sankara, um, not too far off from his death, um, assassination rather, we also know that he said something like, even if you kill me, 1,000 more Thomas Sankaras will be born, you know? But it's not just that, Kai. In death, they they became legends, um, not necessarily for their political success, but more for their ideals of an egalitarian and free society. That's where we will have to leave things for today. African Roots is a cooperation between Deutsche Welle and the Gerda Henkel Foundation. Special thanks to our producers Jürgen Kuhn, Shola Lawal, Philip Zantner, and of course, our voiceover artists. I'm Kai Nebe. And I'm Leila Johnson-Salami. Join us again next time and bye for now. Bye.